Global growth is slowing down, and we've also seen the US yield curve invert, which usually signals that we're going to get a recession in the coming year. So what does that mean for investors, and how can we position our portfolios during these periods of recession? Now, it may not happen immediately, but it's going to happen at some point, so it's good to know how to react. So let's look at that in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. Let's start by exploring exactly what we mean by a recession. The most frequently used definition is that it's two consecutive quarters of decline in real GDP. That's gross domestic product. Where gross domestic product is a total amount of goods and services produced by a country. In the US, the National Bureau of Economic Research has a slightly different definition, and they're the ones tasked with actually defining a US recession. They say that they don't just use real GDP. They also use a range of other indicators, particularly indicators which arrive every month. That allows them to create a more timely definition of when activity starts to decline. And finally, they also consider how large the decline is. And the reason they give for this is that the phrase is a significant decline in activity. The Bank of England has data on UK growth going back all the way to 1700. And a big cause of recessions in the past was war. Here they've shaded the major war periods in blue, and you can see that before the early 1800s, we spent about half our time in one war or another. And as a result, we had this continual onslaught of recessions leading up to the early 1800s. Recessions before the 1850s also depended on things like poor harvests, because the UK economy used to depend more on agriculture. But there were also investment fads, for example, investing in canals, toll roads, or turnpikes as we used to call them. And there were also very large and significant bank failures. You can see that after 1850, the frequency of recessions dropped quite dramatically. But the First World War and the Second World War also had their associated recessions. And most recently, the most significant recession was the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Given that we have this very detailed history of recessions in the UK, we can use that data to see how long a recession typically lasts. In this table, taken from the paper by Hills, Thomas and Dimsdale, published in 2010, they break up the three-century period into five sub-periods. And in the most recent period, between 1952 and 92, the average downturn lasted about three years, followed by an upturn also lasting three years. And that gives an overall cycle of upturn and downturn of just under six years. So if we do get a recession, it may not be over quickly. In fact, three years can be a very long time during a recession. So why are we talking about recession now? If you read the Bank of England's inflation report for May 2019, the first graph in the report shows this quite marked decrease in economic activity for both emerging markets, but also advanced economies. If we look at leading indicators, which give you a slight hint as to what will happen with growth in the near future, and here we're looking at the purchasing managers indices, the manufacturing components have fallen below 50, which is a sign of contraction. But the composite, which combines manufacturing and services, is still above 50. So those PMI indices point to a continued fall in GDP. When discussing the reasons for this fall, the Bank of England, but also the Federal Reserve in the United States, point the finger at trade tensions, and in particular the trade war between the US and China. The direct effect of this has been on the bilateral goods trade between those two countries, but the broader effect has been due to reduced global business confidence. And what's been particularly hard hit is the manufacturing sector. And when companies are worried about economic policy, and in particular trade policy, they're less likely to invest. And in turn, that slows down economic growth. But fortunately, consumption growth has remained resilient. Another thing which has spooked investors is inversion of the yield curve. In my video explaining the bond bubble, I looked at these four country yield curves and discussed why yields are negative in some countries and what that means. So for example, in the United States, this is the yield curve. This is how much it costs the US government to borrow over one month, three months, all the way up to 30 years. The green line is the latest yield curve. So if you buy a 10-year government bond on the day I made this video, in August 2019, you'd be paid 1.54% by the US government. 
But what's really unusual is that that's less than the amount you'd be paid to lend money to the US government over shorter periods of time. Normally, the yield curve is upward sloping because investors demand a higher rate of interest for locking in a fixed rate of borrowing for a longer period. Now, in the US, the yield curve has turned out to be a fairly good predictor of economic growth. And the Cleveland Federal Reserve Bank publishes this model, which takes the difference in yield between short-term bonds and long-term bonds, and as an output, it forecasts GDP growth and the probability of a recession in the coming year. Is the model perfect? Certainly not. As they say, there have been two notable false positives. In late 1966, the US yield curve inverted, but there was no recession. And the same thing happened in 1998. Here they show the data that feeds the model, and the orange line is the steepness of the yield curve. You can see that when it goes negative, there's one of these grey bars that follows, usually within a year, and that marks a US recession. And here's that false positive in 1966, where the yield curve inverted, but there was no recession. But on the whole, when the yield curve inverts, we normally get a recession within one year. It happened here in the 80s, in the early 1990s, in the early 2000s, and then before the global financial crisis. And you can see it's happening again now. Now, there's no economic theory behind this observation. It's just a relationship that people have noticed in the data. And another problem is that there really aren't that many data points. There haven't been that many recessions since the Second World War. So really, we've only got about 10 data points to work with. So the statistics aren't particularly robust. But for what it's worth, the model currently forecasts a 40% chance of recession in the year to come. But it's worth pointing out that the US data is still OK. They've got very strong employment data and fairly brisk wage growth, and their PMI indicator is still above 50. In the UK, on the other hand, the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, NISA, says that there's a significant risk that the economy's already in a recession that began in April, and that if we get a no-deal Brexit, there's the clear possibility of a more material downturn. As an investor, what we really worry about is what happens to asset returns during a recession. And here there's a fairly clear and consistent pattern. On the x-axis here, I show the monthly return on US Treasuries, with large positive returns of about 10% here on the right, and large negative returns of minus 10% here on the left. And I've split the monthly returns into recession periods in red, and periods of growth in blue. And what you can see is that during periods of growth, the total return on treasuries is small and positive. But what happens during a recession is that the average return increases significantly. And you can see that as a shift to the right of this distribution and an increase in the size of the upside tail. You get more large positive returns during a recession. And the reason for that is that during a recession, people sell equities and they buy treasuries because they're seen as much safer. They have a much lower volatility and they carry almost zero credit risk in the United States. We call that selling of equity and the buying of government bonds de-risking a portfolio. If instead we look at equities, in particular the S&P 500, the pattern's exactly the opposite. During periods of growth, the returns on the equity market tend to be stronger. But during a recession, the average return is negative. And if you look at the distribution of returns, you can see that it's grown a large downside tail. In other words, during a recession, you're much more likely to have a large negative return. And that drags down the average return for equity. So if we had a crystal ball that could predict recessions, which we don't, then the best strategy would be to de-risk just before a recession hits. And then just as the recession is ending, we'd switch back into equity. If we look at a broader range of indices, and here I've had to shorten the time period because I don't have such long time series, this is only from 1995 to 2019, I've ordered the assets from left to right according to the amount of the difference in return during periods of recession and growth. So recessions are in red and periods of growth are in blue. And you should be looking at this black line, which is the median return. So for the Hang Seng Index, you can see that during periods of growth, the median return is positive. It's above the zero line. Whereas during periods of US recession, the median return became negative. In fact, the only one of these assets where the return turned positive during periods of recession was gold. And that's because gold is also seen as a safe haven during periods of financial crisis. Now, if you want to actually buy those indices, you can do so very cheaply through exchange-traded funds. And here I've shown six of those exchange-traded funds from the iShares range, which is managed by BlackRock. 
These are the ones which had time series that extended before the global financial crisis. And what you can see is that UK gilts were the only fund which kept their value during periods of US recession. The median is roughly the same during periods of recession and growth, whereas European equity showed much larger volatility or variation in returns during periods of recession. And the median return was also negative. UK corporate bonds also sold off during periods of US recessions, as did European equity, the FTSE 100, and the S&P 500 tracker IUSA. If we did have time series stretching back further in time for these funds, what we'd see would be a very clear split. As investors de-risk, they'd move their money into safer funds, and that would typically be fixed income. And the safest part of the fixed income universe would be government bonds, either issued by the UK or issued by the US. But if you do want a safe version of a US Treasury, you'd probably have to go for the hedged version to get rid of the currency risk. Because for US Treasury funds, the volatility is so small that it's swamped by the currency volatility. And the assets that would sell off would be the riskier ones, and that's the equity funds. Particularly the most risky, which are emerging market stocks. So what strategies should we adopt when we're thinking about recession? The fundamental problem is that we can't predict when recessions will happen. Of course, we can look at PMI indices and we can listen to central banks, but unfortunately they don't know either and there's no perfect model of recessions. So the simplest thing you can do is to create a diversified portfolio. Find the risk level you're happy with and use that to fix your equity bond allocation and keep your fees low. Then simply drip feed your money into your investments over your lifetime and completely ignore the news. Although this sounds like a dumb strategy, for the majority of people in the past, this has produced a good outcome. And the reason why is that over the very long term, shares may give you a bumpy ride with crashes, but if you simply keep your money invested, markets always recover and erase those periods of large loss. And that's true for equities in red, but also true of bonds in blue. An alternative is to have a dynamic strategy where you vary your allocation according to what you think is about to happen in markets. That's exactly what dynamic multi-asset funds will be doing on your behalf. With these multi-asset funds, you often pay a fairly high fee for very expert fund managers to do that fiddling for you. They try and predict what's going to happen in markets and they move your allocation accordingly. However, if we compare them with a fixed allocation for something like a life strategy 80% fund, which is in blue, you can see that this Schroeder Dynamic Planner portfolio actually underperforms that fixed allocation, even though its fee is considerably higher than life strategy. And that's true of many multi-asset funds. This Investec Cautious Managed Fund has also underperformed Life Strategy 60. And even one of the best performing funds like Artemis Income Fund is running roughly neck and neck with the cheaper and fairly dumb Life Strategy 80% fund. So that should be a warning to you that these extremely expert multi-asset fund managers have failed to beat these fairly simple fixed allocation life strategy funds. And if those well-resourced, intelligent, and very well-paid fund managers fail to beat a fixed allocation fund, then you and I would probably also fail to do so. So for most of us, it's probably best to go with a fixed allocation that suits our appetite for risk and our capacity for risk. So even though it doesn't seem very sophisticated, a good response to a recession is simply to keep your strategic allocations and then just rebalance once a year, because that way you can just see through that volatility if you're a long-term investor. Now, if you found that video useful, then just click on the buttons above to subscribe and to support us on Patreon. It costs just $5 a month. You get to join us on Slack and to join us on our Sunday evening call when you can ask any question you like. And as always, thank you for listening.